The tale you're about to be told might come across as the most enigmatic within the true crime category. A youthful sports enthusiast was relishing his holiday, but on an overcast day, to everyone's surprise, he disappeared. For numerous years, investigators were baffled by the potential outcomes. It was only several decades afterward that the answer emerged, causing a chill to run through those who remember the incidents of that particular day. Perched at an elevation of 10,000 feet amidst the magnificent Austrian Alps, the Stubai Glacier Resort stands as a distinctive and relatively undiscovered gem for travelers. The sole access to this location is via a gondola ride upward, whereupon an awe-inspiring panoramic vista greets you, making you feel atop the world. Yet beyond its heady beauty, the area is fraught with hazards, evidenced by numerous cautionary signs dotting the landscape. If you possess the audacity to ignore the restrictions here, you might find your life hanging by a thread at any instant. This was precisely the fate of a 23-year-old Canadian ice hockey athlete. Nonetheless, the narrative that unfolded was even more horrifying. On the 9th of August, 1989, Duncan McPherson left his diminutive red automobile in a verdant valley in Austria, not far from Innsbruck. He stepped out and paused for a moment absorbing the breathtaking scenery that unfolded around him. He found himself near the Austrian Alps, encircled by towering mountains. Born on the 3rd of February, 1966, in Saskatoon, Canada, Duncan was a remarkable defenseman for the Saskatoon Blades, anticipated to shine brightly in future drafts. In 1984, he was drafted by the Islanders, a professional ice hockey team in the United States. Unfortunately, his ascent to the Premier League was thwarted by a grave injury in September of that year, with subsequent injuries following. The continual setbacks left Duncan frustrated, aware that these obstacles were preventing him from achieving his dreams, leading him to reckon that his hockey career might be over. However, rather than succumbing to despair and hanging up his skates for good, McPherson chose to adapt. He embraced a proposition from the Dundee Tigers in Scotland taking up a role as a player coach. In 1989, Duncan made the decision to join a modest professional hockey team, aspiring to excel as a coach since his playing days were compromised. He was expected to commence his new role on the 12th of August. Prior to embarking on his new journey in Scotland, McPherson chose to enjoy a brief hiatus. The rigors of professional sports demand daily extensive training sessions for nearly the entire week, and Duncan decided to grant himself a holiday to roam across Europe, reconnect with old acquaintances, and explore new sites. One of his initial stops was in Germany, where an old friend from his childhood offered him a car. His next intended destination was the Austrian Alps. Notably skilled in skiing, McPherson harbored aspirations to master snowboarding. After relishing the idyllic environment, Duncan secured his car and made his way across the parking lot to the cable car station. The gondola, akin to a sky tram affixed to a cable and adorned with multiple windows, traverses the mountain's expanse, ascending and descending. While some visitors partake in the gondola ride solely for the spectacular vistas from above, its fundamental function is to ferry individuals to certain inaccessible locales on the mountain. The gondola Duncan intended to board was designed to transport riders from the station near the parking lot to an elevation of approximately 10,000 feet in the Austrian Alps. Adjacent to this was another station known as Ice Grotto, which was situated next to the Stubai Glacier Ski Resort. Stubai stood out not just for its wide range of slopes, but because the slope down which skiers and snowboarders glided was not merely a snow-laden mountain slope as typically found at most ski resorts. It was an actual glacier. During the warmer months, when other ski destinations worldwide ceased operations due to snow scarcity, Stubai Glacier Resort encountered no such issues. In the summertime, amid the heat, massive tractors known as snowcats, equipped with large rakes, would ascend and descend the glacier. They pulverized the top ice layer, converting it into snow powder. They refined the ski slope surface by pulverizing the hardened ridges and snow clumps into smooth, uniform particles. This allowed for skiing under any weather conditions. Upon arriving at the lift station and settling into the cabin, Duncan could once again marvel at the scenery through the window. 
the vibrant green of the valley gradually transitioning to the rugged, snow-capped Alps. His path led him to the equipment rental area, where he picked out a snowboard, boots, and all the essential gear for his downhill adventure. McPherson had prudently booked snowboarding lessons in advance. His initial session was set for 11 a.m. Fully kitted out, he awaited his instructor at the glacier's base. The instructor began with snowboarding fundamentals, teaching him how to fit the boots into the bindings, utilize the board's edges, and shared various safety guidelines. Rather than heading straight to the glacier, they started practicing on a level area below, focusing on the nuances of correct snowboarding technique. Only once the instructor deemed Duncan fully prepared did they move toward the button lift, a revolving cable with bars that skiers or snowboarders clung to with a bar while standing on their equipment, which then hoisted them up the slope. Duncan and the guide arrived at the glacier's summit and initiated their premier descent. Securing themselves on the snowboard, they began to inch forward, methodically navigating the incline step by step, mimicking the motion of a cascading leaf. As McPherson was a beginner, he meticulously adhered to his guide's directions, cautiously under his watchful eye. The guide offered Duncan advice on maintaining equilibrium, decelerating, or accelerating. He swiftly discerned Duncan's adeptness at balancing and self-stabilization, his leg strength matched that of a seasoned professional ice hockey player. Following a gradual hour-long journey down the glacier, they arrived at their destination. McPherson performed admirably, though their session concluded slightly prematurely due to a mild onset of rain. Numerous skiers ceased their pursuits and hurried back to the resort to escape the worsening weather. It was nearing 1 p.m., around lunchtime. Duncan and his guide opted for a quick meal. Mid-meal, the guide observed Duncan's sweater drenched through. He recommended Duncan shed his damp attire and offered to dry them in his office. By day's end, McPherson was to collect them. Acknowledging the wisdom in the suggestion, Duncan relinquished his soaked sweater to the guide. Meanwhile, Duncan visited a nearby store and purchased a new sweater. While dining, they delved deeper into personal stories and exchanged amusing anecdotes from their experiences. Post-lunch, as they gazed outside, the rain had subsided, giving way to dense fog blanketing the vicinity. While some skiers ventured back onto the slopes, others preferred to conclude their day. The guide commended Duncan for his commendable performance on his initial snowboard descent and proposed he return to the slope for solo practice of the fundamentals. Should he master these, more advanced techniques would be introduced the following day. Intrigued by the proposition and undeterred by the fog, McPherson, with snowboard in tow, made his way to the lift as the guide attended to another client. On the following day, Duncan's snowboarding mentor arrived at his workplace slightly ahead of schedule. Alighting from the gondola, he made his way to the resort procured a cup of coffee from the same cafe where he had dined with McPherson the preceding day, and after consuming his coffee, he collected his snowboard along with his gear and proceeded to the base of the lift to rendezvous with his pupil from the day before. Nonetheless, when the appointed time for their lesson arrived, Duncan was nowhere to be found. Having waited an additional span, the mentor felt a twinge of disappointment. He had taken a liking to his charge and was eager to impart further knowledge to McPherson that day. Yet he was aware that vacationers frequently forego subsequent snowboarding or skiing lessons for a myriad of reasons during their holiday, or they might simply overlook them. Regardless, the mentor didn't harbor it as a personal slight. He remained optimistic that the young man would make a return, particularly since his sweater remained unclaimed in his office. A week ensuing, Duncan's folks were taken aback by a phone call from Scotland by an official of the Dundee Tigers hockey squad, where their offspring was slated to commence a coaching role following his short stint in Europe. The caller was puzzled as to why Duncan had failed to report for duty. Disturbed, the parents were at a loss. Their progeny had been buoyant about the prospect of coaching the team and would not intentionally miss his inaugural day at work. They assured the team's envoy that they would attempt to reach Duncan and ascertain the cause. Nonetheless, following that conversation, 
The parents swiftly came to terms with the fact that contacting their son was unfeasible. Aware that Duncan had embarked on a European tour, they were clueless about his travel itinerary or the sequence of countries he intended to visit. It was the year 1989, a time when the convenience of making a call with a mobile phone was yet to be a reality. Bewildered about their subsequent steps, the parents couldn't fathom why their diligent son missed his first day at work. In a move that seemed rather extreme at the time, they opted to report him as missing to Interpol, which facilitates international police cooperation. Yet, both were cognizant of the likelihood that their case wouldn't be prioritized by any European law enforcement agency. At 23, Duncan was robust, intelligent, and mentally sound. The only apparent issue was his absence from a few initial days at a new job. It was conceivable he chose to prolong his holiday, albeit unprofessionally, but feasibly. Alternatively, he might have reconsidered the coaching offer or been merely held up. There were several rational reasons for Duncan's non-appearance in Scotland. The authorities suggested the McPhersons initiate their search instead of passively awaiting his return. Without delay, they embarked on this course. Packing their luggage, Duncan's parents ventured to Europe, driven by a sense of urgency and the intuition that something was wrong. Without even a hint of Duncan's European itinerary, they were at a stark disadvantage. Their basic strategy involved distributing countless flyers featuring their son's photo and a contact number across numerous cities. They followed up on every tip, no matter its perceived insignificance. Despite these exhaustive efforts, their progress was non-existent. A month into their quest, they managed to persuade several European news outlets to air a segment on Duncan. A broadcast in Austria proved pivotal. It mentioned the car Duncan used, a small red vehicle borrowed from a childhood friend, which he failed to return as promised. This lead took them to the Stubai Glacier's parking area where the car was parked. Upon discovering this, the McPhersons hastened to Austria to collaborate with the local police. Inside the vehicle, they uncovered Duncan's passport, a letter from his girlfriend sharing his enthusiasm for the move to Scotland, and a bag of spoiled fruit. This discovery propelled the Austrian authorities to intensify the search for Duncan. On the subsequent day, law enforcement officials scheduled a comprehensive search in the vicinity of the discovered vehicle. Duncan's parents were resolved to participate in the search effort. Upon their arrival at a local hotel, they adhered to their routine of distributing flyers adorned with their son's image to anyone they encountered in the lobby and affixed them throughout the premises. Serendipitously, one of these flyers found its way to Duncan's snowboard coach, who recognized the young man instantly, recalling the unclaimed sweater still in his possession. He informed the McPhersons that he had instructed Duncan in snowboarding, and noted Duncan's unexplained absence following their scheduled session. He further revealed that Duncan had never retrieved his sweater, marking the last instance he was seen or heard from. Duncan's mother's initial query concerned her son's disposition, whether he exhibited signs of stress, fear, or worry. The instructor, lacking detailed insights, endeavored to respond to their inquiries, noting Duncan's intention to practice snowboarding later that day. Upon receiving information that Duncan was last spotted at the Stubai Glacier Ski Resort, a contingent of police volunteers and a comprehensive search team ascended the mountain via lift. They meticulously scoured the glacier, descending the mountain's slope, thoroughly investigating the area without uncovering any evidence of Duncan's whereabouts or clues to his vanishing. This process was replicated on the following day, with a significantly enlarged search party covering not just the Stubai Glacier, but the adjacent mountainous expanse. Nevertheless, their efforts were fruitless. Consequently, to the profound disappointment of Duncan's parents, the official search was concluded after the second day. Nonetheless, the McPhersons remained undeterred, dedicating the next 14 years to the search for their son. They revisited the Stubai Glacier repeatedly, meticulously examining every section of the terrain, familiarizing themselves with every resort staff member and each contour of the ski slopes, their resolve never wavered. United by a singular ambition, they persisted in their quest to locate their son. In July 2003, a full 14 years after Duncan went missing, 
An employee at the Stubai Glacier Ski Resort was ascending the mountain via the tow rope. As was his custom, he glanced around the surroundings when a bright object on the slope caught his attention. Assuming it was litter, he intended to remove it and skied towards the yellow item upon reaching the top. However, as he neared, the shock of realization halted him. What he thought was trash turned out to be a fragment of a brightly colored jacket. This discovery eventually led to piecing together the events that likely transpired on August 9, 1989. Following a motivating lunch with his snowboard instructor, Duncan was eager to hit the slopes alone. The fog had descended upon the glacier, providing a serene, tourist-free environment ideal for a novice. With snowboard in hand, he confidently approached the tow rope and ascended to the glacier's peak. Ensuring his bindings were secure, Duncan commenced his descent through the empty, fog-enshrouded slope. With each meter, his confidence surged as he picked up speed, leveraging his innate balance and physical prowess. However, in a fleeting moment, Duncan lost control, snagged an edge, and was thrust forward into a fall, the impact breaking his leg and causing excruciating pain. Crevasses pose significant threats on glaciers, often being vast and inescapable, leading to immediate or delayed fatalities for those who fall in. The Stubai Glacier presented a unique hazard in the form of small, pothole-like fissures on its surface, particularly after rain. These crevices, though smaller, were diligently monitored by resort staff to prevent accidents. Skiers were typically cautioned to remain vigilant of such dangers to avoid mishaps. Yet, the dense fog during Duncan's descent obscured his vision, leading him to unwittingly step into a fissure, resulting in a broken leg. Positioned mid-slope, Duncan was too distant from both the base and the summit to seek assistance, and the fog's density ensured he remained unseen by others. Alone, injured, and stranded, he was left to contemplate his dire situation amidst the enveloping fog. At that moment, another resort worker mounted one of the sizable snowcats stationed at the glacier's summit. These vehicles were generally employed to crush the upper layer of ice, converting it into snow. Given the day's rainfall and significant snowmelt, the worker had to traverse down the slope from the peak to the base, pulverizing the ice to lay down a fresh snow layer. Igniting the engine, engaging the rear rakes with their spinning metal blades and ensuring all systems were operational, the worker commenced the descent. The vehicle proceeded at a snail's pace, barely exceeding three miles per hour, due to the severely limited visibility caused by the mist. Abruptly, at the very last moment, the operator spotted something right in his path. With a swift maneuver to the side, he narrowly avoided a collision, almost making it. However, the heavy treads skirted dangerously close, and the back rakes with their whirling blades snagged the object, dragging it a few feet. The operator immediately shut down the engine, leapt out, and rushed to inspect the object. To his shock, it was a person lying there. Duncan McPherson. The whirling blades had gruesomely disfigured his body. One arm was entirely severed and shredded into pieces, and a leg was nearly completely cut off. It is speculated that Duncan wasn't dead at the time. The injuries were severe but not instantly lethal. In theory, he might have been rescued. Nevertheless, overwhelmed by panic and believing he was unseen due to the fog, the worker made a dire choice. Thinking he was responsible for striking the young man rather than assisting Duncan, he opted to bind him to the snowcat and haul him to a deep crevasse on the glacier. Casting McPherson, possibly still alive, into the crevasse with his severed limbs, the worker employed the snow vehicle to cover the crevasse, concealing his actions. Duncan's demise was sealed in a frozen tomb. Over the ensuing 14 years, the glacier gradually receded until the sight of Duncan's yellow jacket emerged on the ice's surface. This is what the resort worker observed while ascending on the ski lift, mistaking it for debris. Skiing down the slope to retrieve the jacket, he was confronted with the visage of Duncan McPherson, encased in the ice. The young man appeared as though he was still 23, his features preserved by the ice's frigid temperatures, which prevented any decomposition. Initially, the belief was that Duncan had accidentally tumbled into the crevasse during his descent finding himself ensnared in a frosty snare from which he could not escape. 
leading to his demise. The injuries he bore were presumed to be inflicted by the shifting ice. Yet upon the recovery of his body, it was evident he had been cleaved into sections, his apparel ripped apart, and his snowboard shattered into fragments. All remains and broken parts of the snowboard were discovered in proximity. Had Duncan been dismembered by the glacier's natural dynamics, the pieces would have been dispersed at varied locations. This revelation suggested that the young man's death was not simply a result of falling and freezing. He had encountered a tragic end due to a collision with heavy snow-clearing machinery. Duncan's parents were merely notified of the recovery of their son's remains, with the explanation that he had met with an accident years prior. Desiring the full story, the McPhersons sought the expertise of an independent investigator. The analysis of the body parts and snowboarding gear by a range of professionals, including forensic experts, radiologists, and medical doctors, unanimously supported the theory that McPherson had been struck by snow-clearing machinery, after which his body was concealed beneath the ice. Author John Leake, after scrutinizing the photographs depicting the injuries of the late hockey player, penned a book named Cold a Long Time, an Alpine Mystery. In it, he elaborated on this case. The operator of the snowcat present on the slope that fateful day was never formally recognized or prosecuted due to the expiration of the statute of limitations. Accountability for the demise of Duncan McPherson, the youthful Canadian hockey player, has remained elusive. In an effort to avoid controversy, the event was eventually dismissed as a sorrowful mishap. This is the end of the story. Like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. This was Jeremy. See you soon.